Thank you. Uh, hope you hear me there. Uh, this talk will be very different from the rest of the lectures uh, that you have been attending. This talk will focus on the physics of uh, climate change and uh, try to convince you that simple models have a role to play uh, to understand climate change. Now, climate change is a complex phenomena, and uh, it work. Okay, uh, if you look at the global mean temperature, which is the only quantity I'll talk about in this lecture, uh, it has varied a lot over the last uh, four billion years. Okay? Earth has gone through major ice ages and very warm periods, and uh, note that this sketch is uh, qualitative. We don't have quantitative uh, numbers now for this longer period, but we know that there were large excursions of uh, Earth's climate. And uh, what happened? Okay, I don't know. Okay. Okay, this is a front. Okay, this is okay. This one is okay. Sorry, I got it. Yeah. So the Earth's uh, climate has oscillated between ice ages and period with very little ice. Okay. And uh, so there has always been debate how the Earth managed to switch between such extreme conditions, and what are the mechanisms which control that change. And normally when we want to study this problem, which is a complex problem, ideally we should include radiation, energy, thermodynamics, fluid mechanics, and a bit of biology and other things to really study a system. For that, you need uh, very complex uh, models, which I will not talk about uh, here. Okay? Now, how do we know that the Earth's climate changed a lot? The most amazing achievement of the last 50 years has been that people have gone to Arctic and Antarctic and drilled kilometer-long ice cores. So ice actually preserves history of the Earth beautifully. And that is disappearing now due to climate change. And uh, so one of the famous one is Lake Vostok uh, that has gone almost, I think, touched the lake, which is there underneath. And uh, from the ice that is retrieved from this uh, ice core, this ice, you take it to the lab and cut it into uh, small pieces and look at the, uh, and you can see annual layers in many of them. Not always, but. And looking at the isotopic composition of the oxygen atoms in the uh, water, you can figure out what the temperature was. It's an amazing uh, achievement. Okay? And uh, you normally look not at the top where it is loosely packed snow, and so it gets consolidated once you go below about 50 meters. And uh, what's interesting about it, we use the ice to find the temperature, and this little bubble of air, which is trapped by ice all around, contains information about the composition of the atmosphere at that time. It, it preserves it beautifully. Of course, it requires very high technology to suck that a bubble of air and find its composition, but it's all been done by a big international teams. Now, what does it show? So this ice core data shows that uh, now I can put numbers. Now these are more quantitative, not qualitative. And these things show that uh, over the last 20,000 years, this is the present and this is the past, the Earth was in the middle of an ice age about 15,000 years ago, and suddenly underwent a transition fairly rapidly to the present climate. And this took around 8,000 years, approximately. And it uh, went uh, up 8 degrees. So the temperature change was about 1 degree in 1,000 years, and this is abrupt change, supposedly. Okay. Now, we human beings have managed to do much faster. In the last 100 years, temperature has gone up by 1 degree. So the present climate change, which is human-induced, is 10 times faster than any of the events we know in the past. That's the main point. Main point is not that five degree change has not occurred in the past. It has occurred, but it has occurred much more slowly. <clears throat> and the key uh, understanding is that during the last ice age, 30% of the Earth was covered with the ice. Today, it's only 11%. This is a natural change, of course. This is not uh, human-induced. <clears throat> and if you look at that uh, result closely, uh, so there were, in the last 400,000 years of the ice core data, there were four major ice ages, a temperature about 10 degrees below the present. 
And there are a few warm periods also. But most of the time, it was in the Ice Age. And the major interest for everyone is to understand how the transition occurred from this Ice Age to the warm, very, very rapidly. You can see that in the time scale of this picture, this is an almost sudden transition. And it remains here very short period, then jumps back into the next Ice Age. And then there are few minor uh, attempts to come back, but it takes a long time. And then, uh, so the, this is the main issue that every 100,000 years, there's a major Ice Age. In between, there are minor fluctuations. And to understand our Earth system, we need to understand what drove these fluctuations and whether our models of the Earth system we have today to predict future climate, can they reproduce these past events? Only then can we trust it to predict the future. Now, the interesting thing about this ice core data is not only we know temperature, we know the concentration of the important gases which control Earth's climate, that is carbon dioxide and methane. So in this picture, what is drawn is an anomaly, not the actual value. The mean value is taken out. So you can see that during the ice ages, four of them again, the amount of methane, this methane here, and that is uh, carbon dioxide. Methane was well below normal when it was very cold, uh, about 400 parts uh, per billion, actually. And here it is carbon dioxide, which is uh, the major focus uh, uh, right now, which was also minimum around 200 parts per million uh, in those four ice ages. So this graph showed for the first time that there is some connection between temperature and concentration of gas in the atmosphere. Before that, people speculated, nobody really knew, but now we know that they're connected. The only problem with this graph, the beautiful graph, I think one of the best graphs ever shown, is that from this graph, one cannot infer whether the CO2 increase occurred first or the temperature change occurred first. The cause and effect is not known. Why is that? Because in this ice core data, we are taking, looking at layers of ice. Although if you're lucky, you can sometimes see annual layers. Otherwise, you cannot exactly know when that ice was deposited. You have to do very uh, clever isotope dating to figure out. And uh, because ice uh, deposit rates are variable in time. At some time, there are a lot of uh, uh, snowfall. Sometimes there's no snowfall. So it's a big problem trying to exactly find the age, uh, the age of that ice. Okay, there's an error. And how much is the error? About 1,000 years. Okay, that's a problem. So. A lot of people tried who did not know the source of the data. If you are a good mathematician, you can take the data and do lead lead correlation. But you have to know that the data itself is uncertain. Remember that. Okay, now just I'm superposing that to make dramatic uh, point that the variation carbon dioxide and temperature are very closely correlated. But we are not sure which is leading, which is lagging. That is not that clear from that because of the data quality. <clears throat> Now, let's come back to how to explain this. So we want to explain all these through energy balance models. Now, by doing that, of course, we make a big compromise. We are depending only on energy balance to explain uh, the climate. We're ignoring the role of uh, circulation, role of many other things. But this is a starting point. We want to, uh, because we have, um, many of us today, because of the availability computer and huge resources, we can run complex models, no problem. <coughs> But the trouble is, we run these complex models, and after the results come out, we don't know why it is so. Okay? That is the price you pay today in complex models, that they do wonderful things, and we don't know why they do that. So you need simple model as an adjunct to complex models to understand the complex models. So that's the focus of this lecture. Now, the main thing you have to understand that global mean temperature is controlled by how the radiation of the sun enters the Earth and interacts with the atmosphere and the surface. So you can see that of the total energy coming, only about 50% reaches the surface. 30% uh, reflected, and about 20 is absorbed. Okay. Now, on the return, radiation is emitted by the Earth, most of it comes back, by the emitted, uh, emitted back by the atmosphere, and uh, ultimately, of course, the energy that goes out has to be called energy that is absorbed. 100 minus 30 is 70. Uh, uh, 70 at this 70. These two are balanced, okay? Now, small changes in this uh, absorbed energy and empty energy causes all the big temperature change. Now, these are normally modeled using uh, 
big uh, numerical uh, simulation model which have many, many levels in the vertical, in the atmosphere, in the ocean, and they have vegetation and uh, biology and so on. So these models are run over, today you can run it for hundreds of years and look at how the climate evolves. But as I pointed out, that the biggest challenge we have after running the model is to figure out why the model got an ice age or a normal climate. It's not easy. So you need simpler models to interpret these complex models. So I'm talking about simple analytical model for global mean surface temperature. So it's a very modest uh, goal. We're not talking about rainfall, we're not talking about other things, merely temperature. Now, so the simplest model I'm going to invoke is the energy balance between the incoming solar radiation, S0, which, inter which is intercepted by the cross-section of the Earth's uh, uh, sphere. And this is the uh, reflectivity, so-called albedo of the Earth. And one measure, this is the absorption. So this is absorbed radiation. Okay? This is equal to what is emitted in all the uh, surface of the Earth, 4 pi r squared, times effective temperature, uh, which is a, a definition which is not measured. So this tells you what is the effective radiant temperature of the Earth. Okay? And for the present condition, we know from satellite that the albedo is 0.3. That's measured fairly accurately. So we know that effective temperature of Earth at which it radiates like a black body is 255. Okay? That's no use to us because we don't live on that. We live on, on the Earth's surface. So we have to now come back and expand, uh, extend the model to uh, surface temperature. Okay? So the key problem is that Earth emits 240 watts a meter squared, measured by satellite. Earth absorbs 240, also measured by satellite, but it emits 390 at the surface for this temperature, which is also measured in various stations. Okay? So the key point is that the energy radiated by the Earth's surface, only a fraction goes out. And that difference is called the greenhouse effect. That's a huge amount, 150 watts a meter squared. And you have to model that correctly in order to be able to get the surface temperature. Ah, now, the key point, risk point is that Earth and Venus are two planets which are very similar in size, and as a matter of fact, they're called twins. In the origin solar system, they were born at the same time, approximately, and they have very similar composition of the atmosphere and, and surface. But Venus went one way, we went another way. Okay? Venus surface temperature is close to uh, uh, 700 degrees Kelvin, so the greenhouse effect in Venus is, is approximately 100 times larger than Earth. Sorry, this is 150, I'm sorry, this is pretty good, sorry, this is 150, I'm sorry. So it's about 100 times larger. So that has been a big puzzle for uh, people who study past climate and climate of uh, the different planet solar system. Why, although Venus and Earth had a similar uh, origin, they went in different directions. Okay? The simple argument we were told uh, in high school and a little later was that Venus is closer to the sun and hence is hotter. That is not right. Venus is completely covered with clouds. Okay, it reflects more radiation than the Earth. So that's not the reason. Reason is much more complicated. And if I have time, I'll spend time. Otherwise, uh, we'll uh, just mention it. We'll not talk about it. Now, the key thing you have to understand in order to uh, correctly predict the temperature surface is to understand greenhouse effect. This was, in 150 years ago, Tyndall made a clear analogy saying that the atmosphere puts a dam across the outgoing radiation and hence increases temperature. I say this because every year we conduct, next year we can conduct interviews with students to enter our center, and we ask them what is greenhouse effect, they all say it is the absorption of sun's radiation by carbon dioxide, which is not true. Okay? So that's a common mistake made, but this is really the Earth's radiation. And out of the gases that we have, the most dominant gas is not carbon dioxide, but water vapor. And that's what really controls Earth's temperature, uh, because it's very strong absorption band in the infrared. The next important is carbon dioxide. It's also a very uh, good absorption, but it's, it's uh, uh, what you call the uh, amount in the atmosphere is much less than this. That's why it, its role is only uh, half. Now, of course, there's ozone and methane and minor gases. Okay? Clouds also have an effect, which uh, will not be discussed uh, in this lecture. Now, in order to study this uh, Earth's climate in terms of simple model, we Huh? That means 60% of the greenhouse effect is caused by water. Yeah. Yeah. That's the most important effect. The 60% of that 140, 150. 150 watts, yes. Yeah, right. And uh, the key point, I'll tell you why it's important. All the water vapor, the dominant greenhouse gas in the atmosphere, 
If I do a model run in which I remove CO2, huh, that goes into an ice age. You know why? Because as soon as the CO2 is removed and earth temperature drops, water will immediately drop because water vapor is thermodynamically linked to temperature all the time by the clutch club equation. So water vapor is not an independent quantity. CO2 is pretty much somewhat independent. But water vapor depends on CO2 for its existence. So if the CO2 uh, drops, water will also drop. Now what's happening now today is we have increased CO2 and hence water vapor has gone up. For example, the one degree warming we have seen in the last 100 years, not all of it is CO2, CO2 only gave you 0 0.2, 0 0.3. The remaining 0 0.7 is water vapor, clouds, so many other things, ice melting. So water vapor is an interesting uh, uh, constituent which is highly dynamic, it's not static. Yeah, so in order to make the model even simpler, remember the original model had absorbed radiation equal to sigma d to the power of four, and uh, that is nonlinear model. Uh, people felt that's not really required because over the range of temperature we are going to see on the Earth, uh, between minus 20 to plus 30 kind of range, you can fit that uh, outgoing radiation, uh, which is Stefan Boltzmann's law, and you can linearize it very easily. Okay? That's not a bad approximation. That's what I'm going to do. Not necessary, uh, but it is nice to do that. And so our equation is absorbed solar radiation is equal to A plus Bt. Okay, we'll linearize the equation. And the key point is A and B includes this effect. And in calculating A and B, you must take into account CO2 and uh, water vapor in it. Okay? Now, some people do a little more sophisticated one. I won't do that. They keep it separate. Uh, this is a concentration of uh, carbon dioxide here. Uh, this is the present concentration. This is the uh, pre-industrial concentration. So you can include separately the role of carbon dioxide and keep the others here. Uh, uh, but I'm going to now pretend that everything involving uh, greenhouse gas is in A and B. Okay? Now, the simplest model we had, uh, we did not treat the atmosphere. Now, this model, uh, the Earth is here, and we have a layer of atmosphere. We treat the atmosphere as one thin plate, okay? which radiates equally in both directions. And uh, so that is a simple model, which is superior to what was done earlier. So the thick atmosphere treated as one uh, layer, which can absorb solar radiation, can emit uh, infrared radiation. And so the atmosphere here, surface here, and this is the what satellite measure at the top. So you can write out balance for the uh, uh, top of the atmosphere and the uh, bottom of the atmosphere here, and eliminate the unknowns and get the uh, equation for surface temperature and atmosphere temperature, okay? And here Q is that S by four, which keeps coming all the time uh, in this field. Okay, so this, uh, I, I find this model very, very useful because it relates the global mean temperature to just four parameters, incoming solar radiation, reflectivity or the albedo of the Earth atmosphere system, solar absorptivity and emissivity. So the entire climate of the Earth is in four parameters, which is convenient to understand. Now, if you put in this equation, this uh, subjective equation, if you put uh, observed values of solar absorptivity, emissivity of the atmosphere, and reflectivity, you get a number close to the observation. Because this is partly tuned, so it's not a, but it's a very good uh, uh, result that for this value, you get 288. Now, but you have to be careful. This model is a very simple model, works for Earth, doesn't work for Venus. If you take the same model and pretend Venus atmosphere is a thin layer and uh, we know these numbers for Venus, you won't get the answer. Uh, that's because Venus has about approximately 10,000 times more carbon dioxide than Earth. Okay? Venus is an unusual planet. Both Venus and, and Earth had the same amount of carbon dioxide when they were born. On the Earth, almost all the carbon dioxide is in the rocks and in the ocean, a very little in the atmosphere. Venus is exactly opposite. Almost all the carbon dioxide in the form of carbonates on the rocks and dissolved in the ocean all came out. So the amount of CO2 is huge. And in such atmosphere, our modeling as a thin plate goes completely wrong. Okay? So you have to go to more complex models. Now, just for your information, suppose Earth Huh. Atmosphere, yeah. That is the mean atmosphere temperature. So what, what action has you done? Uh, that comes around 250, 260. But I'll tell you, I, didn't, I don't talk much about this because it is a fictitious temperature. 
Because in the real atmosphere, temperature varies with height. You all know that. So there's a some uh, uh, mathematics will love it, some equivalent temperature of the atmosphere. Okay? So you cannot, you cannot measure it and compare it. This can be, this is measured, this quantity is measured. This is not measurable. This is some uh, effective average temperature of the atmosphere, mass weighted. Uh, so it comes around 250, 260. Uh, now, if you have no absorbed solar radiation atmosphere, if there is no atmosphere, we have A0, epsilon 0, you'll get back this temperature from the last model because that's the Earth temperature without atmosphere. But if you take a more uh, interesting case of MSUD equal to 1, albedo equals 0.3, but no atmospheric solar, that is A0, you'll get 303. So what this shows is, if the Earth's atmosphere is not absorbing solar radiation, Earth would be about 15 degrees warmer. So uh, uh, water vapor absorbs in the solar region, so it plays an important role. And so it's important uh, that the sun is absorbed by the atmosphere a little bit, if it didn't, it would go up to 303. As a matter of fact, one of the important debates we're going on today is, we did two major uh, perturbations of the Earth system uh, due to uh, industrialization. One is put a lot of carbon dioxide. That has caused the global warming. At the same time, we have put a lot of sulfate aerosols, lots of particles in uh, the atmosphere. They absorb the solar radiation, especially the, uh, I'm sorry, uh, depends on which aerosol. The sulfate aerosol reflects radiation to space. The soot aerosol, which is very uh, dominant in India and China, uh, we call the burning of coal and uh, diesel, they absorb sun's radiation. So they cool the earth. So if this goes up from 0 to 0 0.3, for example, this will come down below 288. So as a matter of fact, we believe that the temperature of 1.1 degree warming today, the last four months of this year, January, very much April, we may, I'm sure, has been 1.2 degrees above the pre-industrial value. So huge uh, change. And this is not the full extent. If you remove all the aerosols in the atmosphere, the temperature would have gone up even further, maybe 1.5, 1.8. So partly we're not seeing the full effect of CO2 because we also threw in some other junk in the atmosphere. Okay, the uh, advantage of this model is you can draw sensitivity uh, analysis. You can find out for a small change in the input solar radiation, what is the change in temperature? For a small change in the absorptivity, what is the change? For a small change in reflectivity, or the change? So what, uh, this is what you're doing now. Mainly, we have altered the emissivity of the atmosphere by changing CO2. And you can see, only 1% change causes almost one degree change. So atmosphere is a very, very sensitive uh, response to any of these changes. All these are small changes. All are 1% changes. You can see that they all give you temperatures of about one degree Kelvin. <coughs> Now comes the most important thing which we have not uh, talked so far, is the role of ice and water. Now this nice picture shows the huge difference between water and ice. Ice is a perfect refractor, water is almost a perfect absorber. So when you convert a piece of land from ice to water, you are increasing the amount of solar energy absorbed by a factor of 10, okay, 9 or 10. So that's a huge change. So whenever the ice extent of the earth changes, there is a dramatic change in the temperature because of the energy balance change. Okay? That's what I want to highlight next. So this is actual measured data. This is the albedo of the Earth measured by satellite at latitude. This is the zonal average temperature. You can see that at polar latitudes, the albedo is high because of ice and snow. At uh, tropical latitude, it's very low. In between, it is varying almost linearly. Okay? So this is the model I'm going to build now to account for the ice albedo uh, interactions. Now, that's a simple model now. Same model as before. You balance the absorbed with emitted, and you say reflectivity is one value at low temperatures and one value at high temperatures. In between, you have a linear variation. When you do that, the problem is nonlinear now. Previously, you had only one solution for the linear problem. Now, nonlinearity comes due to the way albedo varies temperature, so you have multiple solutions. And the beauty of this uh, simple model is that this is the present climate, 288 degrees Kelvin, around uh, this temperature here. And this is the ice age temperature, around 265, 270. And this is the completely ice-covered Earth called Snowball Earth. So this simple model, based only on energy balance, is able to correctly predict that for the present value of the solar constant, that is uh, 
S of 1365 or 1364. This is the present value of solar. For this value, there are three solutions. Okay. So the question is, if there are three possible solutions, how come we are here and not here or here? Now, one way to argue is that somehow we reach there, and this is a stable solution. So it remains there for a long time until some big perturbation is there. This state is very unstable. Uh, I'll talk about it later. Mind, it, mind the perturbation, this will trend to go to that state. These two are stable states. They completely stroke out Earth and almost uh, ice free Earth are more stable than this state. Okay? And that's why we see the oscillations between this state and this state most of the time, and very rarely between this state and, and that state. Now, the way to understand this uh, problem is look at the interaction between the, let me go back. So this is absorbed solar radiation. This, sorry, this is the emitted uh, radiation on the Earth, is absorbed solar. And uh, the emitted part is slightly nonlinear. Uh, we we delinearized it for simple models. But the absorbed is very nonlinear because of the ice albedo feedback. Now, uh, you can uh, ask various questions about how this intersection point will change if your uh, sun's input is large, our sun's input is very high, the whole line will go up, right? And you'll have only one intersection. So the sun has much more uh, uh, radiation is there in the sun, then you'll get only one ice-free condition. Or if the sun's output is very low, then you'll get only one here. As a matter of fact, there's one big puzzle which I won't discuss today. When the Earth, initially, when the solar system started, the Earth's, uh, the sun's output was much lower than present which we know from study of stars. It was 70% of today's emission. So actually, in the beginning, when the Earth was formed, it should have been ice covered completely because the radiation from the sun was 70% of today. But it was not. All the evidence geology shows it was not. There's a big debate going on. It's called the faint sun uh, paradox. And even today, the only guesswork we have is that at that time, the CO2 content of the Earth was much, much, today, CO2 occupies 400 parts per million of the Earth's compos uh, atmosphere composition. At that time, it was more like 70, 80, 90%. That is the only reason we can think of. OK, so to, uh, all of you, I'll not uh, spend more time on this, this stability analysis. You can easily see that these are stable to any perturbation that is unstable. Okay? And one can work out the, uh, OK, this is to show you how if the solar, this is the changes in the solar input, if it changes, Slightly, not by, by, by a few percent. You come to completely ice covered, or you go a little further up, you'll get completely uh, ice free. Uh, so only in the present value of solar constant are we getting three solutions. Otherwise, you'll get only one solution here, or at the most two solutions. And you can uh, work out the stability. This branch is stable, this branch is stable. So the system comes somewhere, it immediately jumps to that state or this state. Now, you can work out the stability characteristic of this system. This is a fairly simple. All of you, I'm sure, can do that. Uh, you can write down the transient equation and work out the given heat capacity, you assume, of the ocean. You can work out the time constant. People have worked it out. You can uh, then decide whether it is stable or unstable. That depends on the uh, sign of this quantity. Now, the interesting part about the solution is that it has hysteresis. That is, you start from a very low solar. Uh, radiation, uh, let's say the, uh, when the Earth started, it was a snowball, then go, goes on increasing, then it'll, the temperature goes on increasing, then jumps to the state. Uh, it's not a smooth transition, transition, and then you reduce the solar input, it'll come down slowly, it'll go past all these points, and then jump back. So this is the interesting feature of abrupt climate change, okay, which is a feature of this uh, model. Now, so far I've talked about the global mean temperature treated Earth as one single uh, uh, element. Now, quite clearly you can see that's a very crude approximation. In the real Earth, the poles are covered with ice and snow. The tropic is always almost ice-free. So if you want to do a more realistic model, you must have at least one uh, variable, lateral variation. That's what you're going to do next. So what you're going to do is now do the energy balance model again. But here, we have the outgoing radiation, absorption radiation, and heat transferred across latitudes, and uh, in reality, it's transported by atmospheric motion and the ocean circulation. We will not look at that. We'll pretend 
that you can represent that by diffusion, which is a good approximation in many situations. So this model is, again, absorbs all radiation, emission, which is linearized, and uh, diffusion model for the transport. Ah, now, the diffusion is a little more complicated because you have got to account for the fact that the Earth's area keeps changing as you go to higher latitudes. We are on a sphere. So that's accounted for here x is uh, <coughs> cos theta that takes care of the variation of Earth's area. Uh, this is the solar radiation coming in, which is varying with latitude. This is the so-called solar constant, which is this by 4. And uh, this is the albedo, one minus albedo. So this is absorbed solar radiation. This is emitted radiation. This is radiation diffused horizontally. Now, if you are lazy, yeah. No, that is, that is this. In other words, going through the atmosphere, all accounted for in one. Yeah. Yeah, the whole thing, whole column. Okay. Now, if you are lazy like me, I don't want to solve a diffusion equation. One can replace that by a simpler model. You can do that, but this is more, more realistic one. You will use this also. Pretend that if temperature of one latitude <coughs> is higher or lower than the mean temperature of Earth, it will uh, transport heat. Okay. But both give similar answers. There is no uh, big difference. OK. Now, in this model, you are putting the variation of the solar radiation with uh, sine of the latitude, not, I'm sorry, not cos sine of the latitude. And uh, this is well known, because we know from geometry how it varies with the latitude, the relative uh, energy input on an annual mean basis. So this is the example. All of you can do it in your calculator now. Even, even on your, I think, uh, mobile, you can do it. It is that simple. Uh, so this is the incoming solar radiation. Albedo also varies with, uh, with uh, latitude. Uh, this is function only of temperature, our assumption. And this is the heat transport, linear model for heat transport. Okay. And uh, if you put this number, you get reasonable net. So you can actually solve it. Solve the equation very easily. Uh, but steady state. Okay. Uh, so uh, if you assume infinite diffusion, of course, you'll get a horizontal temperature. Uh, if you assume no transport, you get this kind. And so you tune the number, the D, so that you get numbers which are like observed values. Uh, this is just to tell you how it's all solved. I mean, I will not go into details of this solution here. You can solve, uh, you can get nice Alexandria polynomials and so on. Very neat results are there. Uh, uh, so I think these are, I kept it there so that any of you can look at it and uh, see how it is done. Okay. Now, what I want to point out is that if the Earth is, uh, ice free, okay, then you'll get this solution. Because albedo will be the same everywhere, you'll get this solution. If Earth is uh, completely ice covered, you have a higher albedo, then you'll get this solution. Okay. These are two extreme solutions uh, which you already have from the zero dimension model. But the more interesting point is when Earth is partly ice covered. So that this model gives you a nice solution in which there is a point at which this is the Ice covered part of the Earth is ice free part of the Earth. The, the sharp transition, that is, of course, an artifact of the model. In the model, you assume that ice covered part of the Earth will have high albedo, ice free will have different albedo. For example, take ocean. Ocean has albedo of the order of 0.1, 10% only it, it reflects. Well, ice reflects more like 90%. So you uh, put some numbers there, then you get a sharp transition. And these are all analytical solutions, interestingly. All these are analytical. And that is the uh, ice free. And this, uh, sorry. The ice free and ice covered, and in between you have various possibilities. Okay, so when you solve this model now, you have to first find, locate the ice line, and then calculate the temperature of the mean temperature of the Earth. Now, when you do this kind of model, and you, and you ask what will happen if you change the solar input, so called solar constant, and you'll get the same kind of solution, but this solution now tells you what is the boundary of the uh, uh, ice covered region, latitude. So if the solar constant is very, very uh, much lower than the present, say, say about, uh, not much, about uh, this one, about 5% lower, then you'll see that entire Earth ice covered. Zero is the latitude of the ice line. And as you go to uh, uh, somewhere here, you got multiple solution. Then you go to very high, 20% uh, more uh, solar input, then you get ice line at 90. So completely ice free, there's completely ice covered in between. So this is a more complex solution compared to the zero dimension model. Now comes the issue of instability. 
Now, we know that Earth occupied a warm period like what we are today, interglacial, and then jumped to a glacial period for a long time, then came back. The question is, what enabled the Earth from shift from this climate to this climate, okay? And this has been debated for more than 100 years now. Uh, just 100 years ago, a little bit earlier, uh, I think late 19th century, uh, people realized that the ice uh, covered by the Earth had come further down the last ice age, and uh, so they were asking for mechanisms. Okay? What mechanism uh, shifts the Earth from an interglacial glacial and back? Now, the main model that's proposed for this is one that was proposed by Milankovic more than eight years ago. Uh, he was an astronomer who knew how to calculate this, this value based on astronomy, that is, the Earth's and geometry. So he was convinced that the Earth's and geometry played a key role in ice ages. But he was laughed off and he was made fun of, poor guy. And what amazed me about him in this computer age is that all the calculation he did uh, from astronomy was with pencil and paper. There was no other one. Not only that, he was a prisoner of war at that time. In his spare time, he was calculating and getting answers to a third dozen place. And it's an amazing piece of work. But nobody appreciated his work because people thought it was crazy. Because people couldn't believe that small changes in the Earth's orbit around the Sun can cause huge ice ages. Because at the height of the last ice age, parts of New York were covered one kilometer thick ice layer. <clears throat> okay? And you can calculate the amount of energy required uh, to melt that ice, for example. It's a huge amount. And people didn't believe that small changes in the Earth uh, geometry can give you so much extra heat to melt the ice. So they said it's not possible. So he looked at the change in eccentricity of the Earth. Uh, this orbit keeps changing. It's not uh, uh, sometimes circular, now it's eccentric. Then the inclination has changed from uh, 22.2 to now 23.5, it will go to 24. And then the most interesting thing is the precession. That is, where the Earth's North Pole is pointing. Today it's pointing at Pole Star. 11,000 years ago, pointing elsewhere. Okay? And that has a big effect, because if the sun is coming from here, and you're pointing away from the sun, you can imagine that one uh, pole will get more sunlight than the other pole. Okay? So that makes a big difference to the ice formation. So this is the example. Today, the Earth is very close sun in January the winter of the Northern Hemisphere. And uh, that's why most of the ice in the Northern Hemisphere already has melted. Okay? Arctic ice is very small now. On the other hand, 6,000 years ago, it was close in September. And 10,000 years ago, it was uh, here, uh, closest in July. So this is how it changes. Uh, it's uh, periodically due to the effect of uh, Sun, Moon, Jupiter, Saturn, all these influence this uh, orbit of the Earth. All this was documented by Milankovic, I told you, by hand calculation. I was really, I'm really impressed with a guy who can do hand calculation. So this is his calculation for uh, the fluctuation of the precision where it points. And this is the uh, angle of the Earth's obliquity. So this fluctuates with an approximate 20,000 year cycle. This is 40,000 year cycle. This is 100,000 year cycle with, with minor fluctuations here. Uh, so you add all these effects on the incoming solar radiation. And you, you focus on the polar region where the ice is formed. You will see that this, along with the temperature plot here, although they are not perfectly matching, there are a lot of correspondence. Whenever the Earth was warm, the radiant coming in was large, and whenever the Earth was cold, it didn't come up less. So this is the remarkable uh, thing today. Remember that at the time of Milankovitch, we didn't have this data. There was no ice core, there was no, there was only speculation. People looked at uh, rocks and figured out that ice had come up to London or New York, and that's it. No data and temperature was there, so that's why his theory could not be verified. Today, we have very good data to verify the theory, and that shows that there is a very close correspondence between the radiation coming from the sun in the polar regions, especially in, in summer, when it melts the ice, and the ice ages and the warm periods. But it's not the whole story, because there are problems which we'll see very soon. Okay, so here is a comparison between the uh, June insulation, June radiation coming in, at uh, polar region of the hemisphere. This is the uh, temperature taken from the ice core in uh, Dome Fuji in Antarctica. This is CO2, okay? Right now, we'll not look at this. You can see that period, this is warm period, this is cold period. In, during cold periods, this radiation was less by about 100 watts a meter squared. 
approximately. Now, when Milankovitch proposed this, people took that under what's the middle square uh, difference between the cold and the warm periods, calculated the amount of uh, ice you can melt and showed that's not enough. That's how he was uh, laughed off. The reason why they could not understand Milankovitch was they didn't know this, fa this factor, CO2. So remember that when the solar radiation is very high, CO2 also is high. So what really happened was that the, when the temperature of the Earth started going up, a lot of CO2 in the ocean came out of the atmosphere. And as soon as CO2 comes out of the atmosphere, it traps more radiation, and temperature went up gradually. Okay? This, remember, this is, a slow, this is a slow process. It takes thousands of years. So this is a fact which Milankovitch didn't know, of course. Neither did his detract. Nobody knew that. And only this data showed us that there's a close link between <coughs> CO2, methane, and temperature. And that feedback is very important. Okay? Now, the only puzzle now left right now, uh, models do get some of the results quite well. <coughs> the only puzzle we have now is the fact that in the last million years, th this period, uh, Actual GCM type. G GCM type, yeah. Uh, uh, GCM, I'll tell you, there are one more. See, GCM model is one extreme. The, what I'm discussing today is another extreme, ABM. There are many models in between. Uh, the, I'll talk to one or two of them. Uh, so ABM is an extreme uh, model. ABM is used only for diagnostics. You can never really prove anything. Uh, you can play with it, but you cannot. So there are many models in between. GCMs are there. But remember, GCMs have one problem. I cannot rent for 100,000 years. Okay, so I run uh, what they call slices. I run few events. Uh, I cannot do the whole 100,000 years. I can run the model for 100, 200 years now, maybe even 1,000 possible. But uh, I had to give some bonding condition of that era and adjust it to do some in, uh, initialization and uh, assimilation and so on. Uh, so all that has been done. Uh, so you do a time slice. Uh, okay. Now, the order because mystery right now, right now the mystery is over the last million years, the, uh, the most dominant periodicity of what we saw in our graph is 100,000 years. But you look at the solar radiation, its variance is mostly here. So that has been a huge puzzle that the amplitude of the solar radiation fluctuation is highest at 20,000, but your uh, amplitude of the temperature is at 100,000. <clears throat> so that has been the biggest puzzle which uh, is still being discussed by a lot of people. I'll, I'll talk about what it means to what you are learning in this course here. Now, this is called the stochastic resonance, this concept which I found very interesting. <coughs> that is, this is a resonance related to noise in the system. So, uh, so the argument is, this is again 4,000 cycle, and uh, the idea is the system moves with two stable states very rapidly. That's what we saw in the actual data also. The question is, what kind of equation, what kind of condition will promote this transition, OK? Ah. Now, this is the model we had, transient model, OK? And we, we mostly looked at when there's zero, OK? Now we look at the transition, OK? Now, to understand the model's behavior, you integrate this uh, function with temperature, and you get a potential, which is a, a valuable way of looking at uh, the stability of the system. And typically, for the kind of functions you assume, you get a potential of this shape. Okay? So these two are the two stable states. That is the ice-covered and the ice-free states. And this is the partly ice-covered state, this one. Okay? Now, this one, take it as, don't take it literally. This is just uh, for uh, argument's sake. Okay? Uh, so the question that is there, it is only in one of these states. And uh, can it go to other state? How will it go? It has to go through this barrier, right? And the people assumed that the barrier was broken really by more radiation from the sun or some other parameter. But numbers didn't quite agree. Okay? So you will see that if you actually calculate this uh, phi of t, it is connected to the amount of radiation coming in, this, this quantity. Okay? So it will vary with uh, time. For example, 100,000 years ago, this would have had a different shape than now. Shape will change. Now, this is just the, okay. This is just telling you that if the temperature was, between these two will remain here because 
it will not be able to jump the barrier. If you put up it slightly here, it will come back to the state. If it is here, it will put up it, will come back. It will never go over that barrier. Okay? To go over the barrier, it requires some other uh, quantity too. Okay? So the key idea of stochastic resonance is noise is the one which provides you that little kick that is required to go over the barrier. Okay? So noise required to jump across this barrier when the barrier is small. Barrier is uh, varying in height uh, because of sun's input is varying. So this is the, uh, you can see that this is the 100,000 year cycle of the sun uh, radiation changing. And uh, at some point, this barrier is small and the noise is high enough to make it jump. Okay, so that is the idea here. And uh, the way to look at the problem is that at certain times, uh, this barrier becomes small and noise pushes it to this state. It remains that state for a lot of time. And then when uh, this state becomes slightly this one and then it jumps back. <clears throat> so the idea is that there are occasions in the history of the Earth when the barrier is small enough that the noise which is natural in the system due to atmospheric uh, phenomena, weather is always a noise in our system, it will push it to that state. Okay, so what's interesting I found is that <clears throat> it is a uh, periodicity controlled by noise, but actual periodicity is driven by sun, not by, not by the noise. Noise is only a, an agent, okay? So the, if, you, if you believe this theory, I mean, this theory is not completely accepted yet. If you believe this theory, then remember that the highest variance of the sun's radiation was at 20,000. So the logic of this theory is very simple. 20,000 is the basic period, but you won't find ice age every 20,000 years because this barrier is not always small. So now you're not able to push it. So it'll miss two or three rounds, and after five rounds, it jumps. So that's the logic, okay? And it is, it is quite convincing because we have in the actual uh, data we have here, uh, we have in the actual temperature uh, data, we have 20,000 year cycle, we have 40,000, we have 100,000. This is the dominant one. These are there. Okay. So now and then, it just jumps out of 3,000 years into an ice age, but usually comes back quickly. Then little later, so argument about people who believe in stochastic resonance is that if it misses three or four cycles, then it will come at 100,000. If it doesn't miss, then it will come at 40,000. So all these are supposedly multiples of 20,000, approximately, within the error of measurement room of that. So to me, this is a very nice idea. I'm sure this is we discussed more detail by the other speakers in this uh, workshop. So this is present state of subject. I can tell you that not everybody believes in it. There are people who have doubts about it. Because in doing this, we have used a very simple model of the, uh, of the, uh, the energy balance model. And the reason is that when you run these complex GCMs, they don't always reproduce uh, this uh, stochastic resonance, okay? Now, that could be due to the models being bad. We don't, we're not, models are not perfect, okay? So the fact that GCMs don't reproduce multiple states does not mean that's the wrong idea. Uh, we have to figure out whether the GCMs are right or not. That question is always there. Okay, I'll come close to my time, so I'll not spend too much time now. <clears throat> so, the, if you use the uh, Milankovitch theory, the orbital forcing, the, you get the right spectrum, but the amplitude is too small at the right uh, frequency. You add noise, okay? Then you get the right, you have, you have noise, but not that forcing. You add amplitude, but not the spectrum. There's no peak at all, you flat spectrum. If you have a combination, it works. And you can run these simple models on your, uh, on your, on your laptop. It, you can show all these results, beautiful results. Okay? Uh, now, the real interesting point is that I've talked earlier about sun, sun's forcing. CO2 also is changing. So the multiple states here is driven both by the solar incoming radiation as well as the CO2. Both play a role. So in the paleoclimate history of the Earth, there have been occasions when the, uh, the amount of CO2 was much higher than 1,000 ppm also. Okay? So we are right now somewhere here, 280 to 560 range, but there have been periods when it's very low and very high. Both have occurred. So you have to look at both CO2 and, and, and sun together. Now comes the, so we ask, there are intermediate models now. The, this, EBM is one model, GCM is another extreme. In between, there are very clever models. There's a whole book on it by Saltzman, beautiful book, uh, in which he, this is the first equation is, you can think of the energy balance model, about ice mass. Okay? 
Second equation is about, sorry, this is the energy, deep ocean temperature. This is uh, related to the albedo of the Earth, the ice mass. And the last is CO2. So there are three models here. One for how CO2 is exchanged between ocean, uh, land, and the atmosphere. The other is how deep ocean temperature changes, which is mainly energy balance. And how ice changes, this is ice, uh, uh, solid mechanics involved here, how ice changes. And if you combine these three, these are nonlinear models. And Salzman is able to reproduce all the three cycles, 20, 40, and 100. And so Salzman won't believe in stochastic resonance. He, wrote, he spent his whole life on this topic. An interesting uh, sidelight is Salzman was a student of Lorenz. Okay? And the story I hear, which is not confirmed, I will not tell it in the public, I hear from people that when he worked for his masters with Lorenz, Lorenz and he had a fight. Lorenz uh, didn't believe there was uh, this concept of uh, chaos. Okay? Salzman got chaos. He had, he had used this kind of model to study chaos. He got chaos. Lawrence told him, you made a mistake, please check your <laughs> program. And uh, he left Lawrence and went on to do a PhD elsewhere. And uh, a few years later, Lawrence published a paper on, on chaos. Okay? And so there are two sides of the story. I don't know which is the right story. The story, uh, people who believe in Salzman, who was a great uh, geophysicist, say that he should have been given his name because he won the word discovered it. But people who know Lawrence, who was a great mathematician, uh, feel that he already had the idea in his mind. And at the point when uh, Salzman got the idea, I think maybe he didn't recognize it, but he wrote uh, the, the famous three equation model. Uh, so their argument is that uh, Salzman didn't play a role. But there's a very interesting sidelight. Uh, but he went on to do this work. Uh, and the only interesting point I can tell you is that Salzman was a gentleman. He never raised a controversy in his lifetime. He kept quiet. But there's a little footnote you will see in Lorenz's paper with Salzman's name. Okay, remember that. So and, and Lorenz did recognize Salzman's contribution. Okay, I think, I'll, I think I'll stop here because there are other things, but I run out of time, so I'll stop here. Thank you. Yeah. I can't hear you. There. Too much echo here. Yeah, can you hear loud, loudly? Yes, as a matter of fact, I must tell you, when I was in high school, 50 years ago, the major discussion was on the next ice age. Because according to the theories we have, the next ice age will come anywhere between 10 to 20,000 years from now. Okay? And it looks like human beings will ensure it won't come. The way we are warming the Earth by 5 degrees, it won't come. Okay? But if human beings didn't interfere, as a matter of fact, there's even more interesting theory by Rudiman. See, we are talking about CO2. Uh, Rudiman made a very interesting point, which is still controversial, that when... Agriculture started on Earth. Large scale rice cultivation, methane emission went up dramatically. Okay? And Rudiman's argument was that if 5,000 years ago rice cultivation had not occurred, we would be on the way to the Ice Age already. So, for example, uh, coming on the last Ice Age, we were at about uh, 280 ppm, and then we should have started declining. But around the time, rice cultivation started in a big way in the tropics. And he claims that it started increasing to 290, 300. But that's very controversial because the data we have is not good enough to uh, uh, nail the theory. But the next ice age would have come anywhere between 10 to 20,000 years from today. As a matter of fact, very nice models which extrapolate. For example, we saw this uh, nice cycle. You can extrapolate next uh, 5,000 years. You'll see the ice age coming. Yeah. Ah. Yes, uh, see, the point, only problem is the glaciers melt very, very slowly. So there is a big uh, controversy about that because the question that we don't know is 100 years from now, how much of the glaciers will melt? We don't know. Okay? That's a big question mark. Partly because no research was done on this topic for a long time. And glacier melting is not like ice melting on this table. It's more complicated. Glacier has all kinds of complex... Uh, uh, no, there are rivers under the glacier. It's very complicated. Nobody has analyzed it. And you can imagine how difficult it is to go and make uh, measurements there. People are doing it now. Uh, one of my colleagues in my center was very hard uh, to do field measurement. So we really don't fully understand how rapidly the glacier uh, melts and collapses. Okay? So there are two views here. One view is that it will melt very slowly. 
So the sea level rise may be half a meter uh, more than today, which is not good, but it's not too bad. But I also believe that it will be two to three meters. If it's two to three meters, I can tell you that we in India are in deep trouble because the uh, country which is most affected by sea level rise is Bangladesh. Okay? And we surround them all around. So if, if there is a two meter sea level rise, whole of Bangladesh will go, entire Bangladesh. And they have to come to India. There's no other choice, no other, no other place to go. Okay? That's a serious issue. As a matter of fact, uh, although publicly, for a long time, the government denied global warming, I know that there is a very secret research going on about the catastrophic consequence of global warming uh, in the US Navy. Okay? US Navy had a very nice, they do all kinds of, uh, what you might call, uh, imagine exercises. Okay? The question they asked was, if there is a rapid increase in sea level, uh, one or two meters, along with a cyclone, you will have about five million people to evacuate in Bangladesh. They start calculating how many Navy vessels you require to evacuate them. I think even India should do that, because to me, that is a possibility which cannot be ruled out. And what's interesting is that, although I'm talking about uh, uh, sea level rise due to uh, glacial melting, that is not the immediate threat. The immediate threat to Bangladesh after population explosion is the fact that Bangladesh is sitting in an area which is so uh, unstable, it's sinking. So the rate of sinking of Bangladesh is much faster than the sea level rise. Sea level rise is three millimeters per year. Sinking is 10 millimeters per year. Dhaka is sinking, okay? Now, why is it sinking? The reasons are complex. One is uh, Bangladesh blames us because we built a dam. We built a dam across the Ganga and China is building a dam across Brahmaputra. So no silt is coming to Bangladesh. Silt is what keeps the land going, okay? That's the first one. Uh, that's a long-term problem, okay? The second one is their own making. They are pumping groundwater in Dhaka. When you pump groundwater in Dhaka, the land will sink. Because when you uh, remove uh, the groundwater, there is air force there, which will just collapse. And lastly, they are also uh, doing underground gas exploration. So Bangladesh is doing very, very dangerous things. So uh, most of Bangladesh is sinking already. So the first threat will come not from glacial melting, but from local sinking. And that will combine with cyclone. See, the cyclone is the real, uh, uh, what you call, the immediate uh, threat. And the cyclone will give you easily two, three meters rise for a, for a few days. Okay. So this is the thing I think we, have, we will have to face. And I don't know how far Indian government think about it. <clears throat> because Indian government cannot afford to sit back and say, we will not do anything. Because we are, we are the neighbors. They are the only place to go to. So Americans are thinking very hard about how to handle that. Indian government may be doing it, I'm not aware of it. Okay.